Welcome back to Boston, Massachusetts. We're here at the Seaport. You're watching theCUBE's coverage of Red Hat Summit 2022. My name is Dave Vellante and Paul Gillen is here. He's my co-host for the next day. We are going to dig in to the, the famous RHEL, Red Hat Enterprise Linux. <laughs> Gunnar Hellickson is here. He's the Vice President and General Manager of Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Gunnar, welcome to theCUBE. Good Thank, to see you. Thanks for having me. Nice to be here, Dave Paul. RHEL 9 is, uh, Yep. Wow, nine, holy cow, yep. it's been a, a lot of iterations. That's the, the highest version of, of RHEL we've ever shipped. Yeah, it, yeah. yeah, and now we're talking Edge, right? Yeah, that's right. And, uh, so what's, what's inside, tell us. So we've got, uh, so we, you know, we got, we got three kind of people we need to keep happy with, uh, with a new RHEL release. The first is the, the hardware partners, right, because they rely on RHEL to light up all their delicious hardware that they're making. And you got the application developers and the ISVs who rely on RHEL to be that kind of stable platform for innovation. And then you've got the operators, the people who are actually using the, using the, the, the operating system itself and trying to keep it running every day. Um, and we got something for everybody, I think. Uh, so we've got on the, um, I'll start with the hardware side, which is uh, something, as you know, real success, and I think you talked about this with Matt just a, in a few, a few sessions earlier, um, that the success of Rails really hinges on our partnerships with the with the hardware partners, and uh, and in this case we've got uh, let's see in Rail Nine we've got all the usual hard all the usual hardware suspects, and we've added uh, just recently in January we added support for ARM servers uh, as a you know uh, general ARM uh, server class hardware, um, and so that's a that's something customers have been asking for. Delighted to be shipping that in Rail Nine. So now ARM is kind of a uh, first class citizen, right? Uh, alongside x86, Power, Z, and all the, all the, all the other usual suspects. Um, and then of course working with our, our favorite uh, public cloud providers, so making sure that RHEL 9's available at AWS and Azure and GCP and all of our other, uh, all our, all our other uh, cloud friends, right? Yeah, so we're seeing, uh, you mentioned ARM, we're seeing ARM in the enterprise, yep. we're obviously seeing ARM at the edge. Yep. You guys have been working with ARM for a long time, you're working with Intel, you're working with NVIDIA, you've got some announcements this week. Gunnar, how do you keep Linux from becoming Franken OS yeah. with all these capabilities? Yeah, yeah, this is a great question. So first is, uh, the most important thing is to be working closely with, I mean the whole point of Linux and the reason why Linux works is because you have all these people working together to make the same thing, right? Um, and so uh, fighting that is a bad idea. Um, working together with everyone, leaning into that collaboration, that's an important part of, of making it work over time. Um, the other one is having, uh, just like in any good relationship, having healthy boundaries. Uh, and so <laughs> making sure that, we, that we're clear about the things that we need to keep stable and the places where we're allowed to innovate and striking the right balance between those two things, um, that allows us to continue to ship kind of one coherent operating system while still keeping literally thousands of platforms happy. Right? So you're not trying to suck in all the, f the full function, you're trying to accommodate that function that the ecosystem is going to develop. Yeah, that's right. So it's so the idea is that what we strive for is consistency across all the infrastructures, and then allowing for kind of optimizations. And you know, we still let ourselves kind of take advantage of you know whatever indigenous feature might appear on mm -hmm. thus and such an ARM chip or thus and such a cloud platform. Um, but really, we're trying to deliver a uniform platform experience to the application developers, right? Because they can't be having like they can't be kind of one version of RHEL over here and another version of RHEL over here. The ecosystem wouldn't work. The whole point of Linux, and the whole point of Red Hat Enterprise Linux is to be the same so that everything else can be different. And what, what incentives do you use to keep customers current? To keep customers current? Yeah. Um, well, so the, the best thing to do, I found, is to meet customers where they are. <laughs> and so, um, a lot of people think, you know, we release RHEL 9, at the same time, we have Red Hat Enterprise Linux 8, we have Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7, all these are running at the same time, and then we also have multiple minor release streams inside those. So at any given time, we're running, let's say, a dozen different versions of RHEL are being maintained and kept up to date. And we do this precisely to make sure that uh, we're not force marching people into the new version. Um, and they have a Red Hat Enterprise Linux subscription, they should just be able to sit there and enjoy the minor version that they like. Um, and we try and keep that going for Even as long as possible. 10 years out of date? Uh, well, so 10 years, interesting you chose that number because that is the, because <laughs> that's the, that, that is, that, the, that is the, that's the end of the life, right. And so, uh, 10 years is about uh, as, that's the natural life of a given major release. Um, but again, inside that you have several 10 year life cycles kind of cascading on each other, right? So nine is kind of the start of the next 10 year cycle uh, while we're still living inside the 10 year cycle of seven and eight. So lots of options for customers. Um, 
How are you thinking about the edge? How do you, def def I mean, let's not go into the definition, but uh, <laughs> at a high level. Like, I, I was at a conference last week, it was Dell Tech World, I'll just say, they mm -hmm. were sort of, the edge to them was a retail yeah. store. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Lowe's. Okay, cool, I guess that's kind of edgy, yeah. I guess. Yeah. But I like, think, I think space is the edge. <laughs> right, know? right, right. Or yeah. a vehicle. Yeah. How do you think about the edge? All of the above, or but it's, it, it, the exciting stuff to me is that far edge, but I wonder if yeah. you can comment. Yeah, so the, it, it, there's all kinds of taxonomies out there for the edge. Uh, for me, I try and, I'm a simple country product manager at heart, and so I try to keep it simple, right? Uh -huh. uh, and the way I think about the edge is, here's a use case uh, in which somebody needs a small operating system that deploys on a probably a small piece of hardware, usually, uh, varying sizes, but it could be pretty small. Um, that thing needs to be updated without any human touching it, right? And it needs to be reliably maintained without any human touching it. Um, usually in the edge cases, actually touching the hardware is a very expensive proposition, so we try and be as hands-off as possible. No truck rolls. No truck rolls <laughs> ever, right, yeah, exactly. And then uh, now that I've got that stable base, uh, I'm going to go take an application, I'll probably put it in a, in a container for simplicity's sake, and same thing, I want to be able to deploy that application, and if something goes wrong, I need to be able to roll back to a known good state, and then I need a set of management tools that allow me to kind of touch things, make sure that everything is healthy, make sure that the updates roll out correctly, you know, maybe do some A-B testing, things like that. Um, so I think about that as that's the, when we talk about the edge case for RHEL, that's the kind of the horizontal use case, yeah. and then we can kind of do uh, specializations inside particular verticals or particular industries, but at bottom, that's kind of that, that's the use case we're talking about when we talk about the edge. And, a, and an assumption of connectivity at some point. Yeah, right? yeah. Know, yeah. You don't have, you yeah. have to always be on, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. intermittent, latent, eventual connectivity. Yeah, yeah. Connectivity. yeah that's right. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. So, so, tech terms. Red yeah. Hat was originally a one-trick pony. I mean, RHEL was it. And yeah. now you've got all of these other, uh, uh, these other extensions and, and uh, uh, Different, different markets that you expanded into. How do you, what's your role in coordinating what all those different functions are doing? Yeah, so, the, so uh, what, I, what I find is that the, uh, you look at all the innovations we've made, whether it's in storage, whether it's in OpenShift or, and elsewhere, RHEL remains kind of the beating heart, right? It's the place where, it's the place where everything starts. And so, uh, you know, a lot of what my team does is we're trying to, yes, we're trying to make all the partners happy, we're also trying to make our internal partners happy, right? So the OpenShift folks need stuff out of RHEL just like any other uh, software vendor. And so uh, I really think about RHEL is, yes, we're a platform, yes, we're a product in our own right, but we're also kind of a service organization for, for all the other parts of the portfolio. And the reason for that is we need to make sure all this stuff works together, right? Mm -hmm. um, part of the whole, uh, reasoning behind the, re the Red Hat portfolio writ large is that each of these pieces build on each other and complement each other, right? And so that's a, I think that's an important part of the Red Hat, the RHEL mission. Yeah. There was an article in the journal yesterday uh, about how the tech industry was sort of, you know, pounding the, the drum on H-1B visas. Mm -hmm. There's a limit, I think it's been the same limit since, I don't know, 2005, 65,000 yeah. a year. Yeah, right. Um, we've, we're facing, your know, customers are facing, you guys I'm sure right, as well, we are, you know, real skills shortage, yeah, that's right. a lack of talent. Yeah. Um, how are you seeing companies you know, deal with that? What, what are you advising them? What yeah. are you guys doing yourselves? Yeah, 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 so it's interesting, especially as, this, especially as we're going through, everybody went through some flavor of digital transformation during the pandemic, and now everybody's going through some, and kind of connected to that, everybody's making a move to the public cloud. Well, they're also, like, they're making operating system choices when they're, when they're making mm -hmm. those platform choices, right? And uh, I think what's interesting is that what they're coming to is, well, I have a Linux skills shortage, and for whatever, for a thousand reasons, the market is not provided enough kind of Linux admins, I mean, these are very lucrative positions, right? You they yeah. would command a lot of money, you would expect their supply would eventually catch up, but for whatever reason, it's not catching up, so, okay, I can't solve this by throwing bodies at it, so I need to figure out a more efficient way of running my Linux operation. People are making a couple choices. The first is, they're creating, uh, ensuring that they have consistency in their operating system choices, whether it's on-premise or in the cloud or even out on the edge. If I have to juggle three, four different operating systems as I'm going through these three or four different infrastructures, like that doesn't make any sense, because the one thing is most precious to me is my Linux talent, right? And so I need to make sure that they're consistent, optimized, and efficient. The other thing they're doing is tooling and automation, and especially through tools like Ansible, yeah. right? Um, being able to take advantage of as much automation as possible and much consistency as possible um, so that they can make the most of the Linux talent that they do have. And so with Red Hat Enterprise Linux 9, in particular, your, your CS make a big investment in things like 
uh, more automation tools for things like SAP and SQL Server deployments. You'll see us make investments in things like you know, basic stuff like the web console, right? That we should now be able to go and point and click and do basic Linux administration tasks. That lowers the barrier to entry and, uh, and makes it easier to find people to actually administer the systems that you have. As you move out onto these new platforms, particularly on the edge, many of them will be much smaller, limited function. Yeah. How do you make the decisions about what features you're going to keep or what, what you're going to keep in RHEL when oh, yeah. you're running on a thermostat? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so let me be clear. I don't want RHEL to run on a thermostat. I can't handle the margins on something like that. But at the <laughs> you're running on you're running on the GM. Yeah, uh, no, that's right. And so the so the choice of the the most important thing we can do is give customers the tools that they need to make the choice that's appropriate for their deployment. Uh, I have learned over several years in this business that if I start choosing what content a customer decide, wants on their operating system, I will always guess it wrong, right? So my job is to make sure that I have a library of reliable, secure software options for them that they can use as ingredients into their solution and they give them tools that allow them to kind of curate the operating system that they need. So that's the tool like Image Builder, which we, uh, which we just announced. The Image Builder service lets a customer go in and point and click and kind of compose the edge operating system that they need, hit a button, and now they have a, an atomic image that they can go deploy out on the edge reliably. Right? Gunnar, can you clarify the cadence of releases? Uh, oh yeah. that you guys, the change that you made there, yeah. why that change occurred, and what, what's the standard today? Yeah, so uh, back when we released RHEL 8, so we were just talking about uh, hardware and you know, it's ARM and x86, all these different kinds of hardware. The hardware market is, uh, internally, I, I tell everybody, the hardware market just got real weird, right? It's just got, the, the schedules are crazy, we got so many more entrants, everything is kind of out of sync from where it used to be. It used to be there was a there was a metronome, right? You mentioned Moore's Law earlier, it was yeah. like a 18 month metronome, everybody could kind of set their watch to. Right. Um, that's, so that's gone, and so now we have so much hardware that we need to, that we need to reconcile. Um, the, uh, the only way for us to provide the kind of stability that in, consistency the customers were looking for was to set a set our own clock. So we said three years for every major release, six months for every minor release. And that that we will ship a new minor release every six months and a new major release every three years, whether we need it or not. Mm -hmm. um, and that has value all by itself. It means that customers can now plan ahead of time and know, okay, in 36 months, the next major release is going to come on, and now that's something I can plan my workload around. That's something I can plan a data data center migration around and things like that. So the consistency of this and and it was a terrifying promise to make three years ago. I am now delighted to announce that uh, <laughs> we actually made good on it three years later, right? Um, and plan to again uh, three. Years from now, is so, it? Go ahead. Ahead. Is it? Is it just follow up. Is it primarily the processor optionality and diversity, or as I was talking to an architect, system architect the other day, and his premise was that we're moving from a processor centric world to a connect centric world, not just mm -hmm. the processor, but the memories, yeah. the I/O, the yeah. controllers, the NICs, and it's yeah. just keeping that system in balance. Does that affect you, or is it primarily the processor? Oh, it absolutely affects us. Yeah. yeah. How so? so? Yeah. So. The, so. Um, the operating system is the thing that everyone relies on to hide all that stuff from everybody else, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so if we cannot offer that abstraction from all of these hardware choices that people need to make, um, then we're not doing our job. And so that means we have to encompass all the hardware configurations and all the hardware use cases that we can in order to make a in order to make an application successful. So if people want to go disaggregate all of their components, we have to let them do that. Um, if they want to have a kind of more traditional kind of boxed up OEM experience, they, sh they should be able to do that too. Um, so yeah, this is what I mean is because it is RHEL's res responsibility and our duty to make sure that people are insulated from all this chaos underneath, um, that's a, that is, that, is a, that is a good chunk of the job. Yeah. yeah, the hardware and the OS used to be inseparable, right? Yeah, Before right, yeah, Linux, yeah, yeah. right? That's right, so yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. that's hence yeah. the importance of hardware. Yeah, that's right. I'm curious how your job changes. So you just, every 36 months you roll out a new release, which you did today, you announced a yep. new release. You go back into the workplace in yep. two days. Yep. How is life different? Uh, not at all. So uh, the only constant is change, right? Um, and to be honest, you know, a major release, that's a big event for our release teams, that's a big event for our engineering teams, it's a big event for our product management teams, but all these folks, have moved on, like we're now, we're already planning RHEL 9.1 and 9.2 and 8.7 and, and, and the rest of the releases. And so it's kind of like brief celebration and then right back to work. Mm. Okay. Um, yeah, doesn't yeah. change much. So yeah. what can we look forward to? What's the future look like of RHEL? RHEL 10. 
Oh yeah, more, bigger, stronger, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. faster, uh, more optimized for those and such, and yeah. Uh, Longer, lower, wider. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I, I am curious about CentOS Stream. Yeah. Uh, because there was some controversy around the end of life for CentOS yep. and the move to CentOS Stream. Yeah. A lot of people, including me, are not really uh, clear on what Stream is and how it differs from yeah. CentOS. Can you clarify that? Absolutely. So. Uh, when Red Hat Enterprise Linux was first created, uh, this was back in the days of Red Hat Linux, right? And because we couldn't balance the needs of the hobbyist market from the needs of the enterprise market, we split into Red Hat Enterprise Linux and Fedora, okay? So then for 15 years, uh, yeah, about 15 years, we had uh, Fedora, which is where we took, took all of our risks. That was kind of our early program where we started integrating new components, new open source projects, and all the rest of it. And then eventually we would take that innovation and then feed it into the next version of Red Hat Enterprise Linux. The trick with that is that the Red Hat Enterprise Linux work that we did was largely internal to Red Hat and wasn't accessible to partners. And uh, we've just spent a lot of time talking about how much we need to be collaborating with partners. They really, a lot of them had to wait until like the beta came out before they actually knew what was going to be in the box. Okay, well that was okay for, for a while, but now that the market is the way that it is, things are moving so quickly, we need a better way to allow partners to work together with us further upstream from the actual product development. So that's why we created CentOS Stream. So CentOS Stream is the place where we kind of host the party and people can watch Red, the next version of Red Hat Enterprise Linux get developed in real time. Partners can come in and help. Customers can come in and help, and we've been really proud of the fact that Red Hat Enterprise Linux 9 is the first release that came completely out of CentOS Stream. Another way of putting that is that Red Hat Enterprise Linux 9 is the first uh, is the first version of RHEL that was actually built 80, 90 percent of it was built completely in in the open. Okay, so that's the new playground. Yeah, you, that's you right. You did get a lot of negative pushback when you made the announcement. Yep. Is that basically because the these cus the CentOS users didn't understand what you were doing? No, I think that the CentOS Linux, uh, CentOS, when we, f when, when we brought CentOS Linux on, this was one of the things that, that we wanted to do, is we wanted to create this, this space where we could start collaborating with people. Here's the lesson we learned. It is very difficult to collaborate when you are downstream of the product you're trying to improve. Uh, because you've already shipped the product, and so once you're collaborating downstream, you, any changes you make have to go all the way up the water slide uh. before they can head all, all the way back down. So this was the the, pivot, the real pivot that we made was moving that partnership and that collaboration activity from the downstream of Red Hat Enterprise Linux to putting it right in the critical path of Red Hat Enterprise Linux development. Great. Well, yeah. thank you for that, Gunnar. Thanks for coming on the cube. It's great, yeah, to, my great to see you, and uh, have a great day tomorrow. Thanks. And uh, we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. We start at uh, 9 a.m. East Coast time. I think the keynotes will be here right after that to, to break that down, Ball Gillen and myself. This is day one uh, for theCUBE's coverage of Red Hat Summit 2022 from Boston. We'll see you tomorrow. Thanks for watching.